Julio Bruno, and welcome to The Internationalist, a new podcast that explores topics across cultures and industries, puzzling out what it means to be a global citizen in the modern age. The Internationalist delves into a range of topics, from global leadership, trends in the travel and startup breakthroughs and political movements. In each episode, we'll shine a light on subjects and explore connecting through stimulating conversations across borders with some of the world's most interesting and influential figures. Today I'm joined by my friend Manuel Gomez Anuarde. Manuel is an international recognized expert in landscaping, architecture, garden history, and author with particular expertise in Islamic art and culture, ancient history, and arts. Manuel started his career as an economist, working first for the BBC in London, and then for Richardson Merrill as research director in Paris and Madrid. Later, he worked in Saudi Arabia for TIPSA, the consulting and engineering group, as his director in Riyadh. Following his return to Spain, he worked as an antique dealer specializing in garden furniture and later as a landscape gardener following his studies at the Landscape Architecture School of Castillo de Batres. Since the mid-90s, Manuel has been a prolific author and lecturer in subjects such as gardening history, art, Islamic culture, and garden design, having published 11 books and conducted numerous lectures around the world. In 2010 and onwards, he created the Jardín Alquímico de la Trinidad, the alchemical garden of Trinity, in the Spanish village of Ucles, Cuenca, an alchemical garden based in the alchemist philosophy. The garden translates the different alchemist phases in a path of initiation in search of perfection and wisdom in equilibrium with the universe. This private garden has been featured in numerous international publications on TV and is the place where Manuel wants to spend his time when not traveling around the world for one of his acclaimed lectures. Well, good morning, Manuel. Thank you for being here in my home studio. This is unusual, you know, like uh, I, I haven't done many of these at home. I think you're my third guest at home. So I cannot always ask the question, where are you? Well, you're in London. Yes. So welcome, Manuel. Good morning, Julio. Good morning. I'm delighted to be here. So, Manuel, we know each other for a long time and you have a rather unusual story. You're an economist. You're an antique dealer, you're an Arabist, you're a landscape architect gardener, you're a humanist. Who is Manuel Gomez Anuano? I would like to know who I am, really. I will tell you an anecdote. Short time ago, I was in a small village, tiny village, not far from Madrid, where I have a garden, and there was a lady who approached me staring me down for a while and suddenly she said who are you i don't know you she's very surprised she didn't know me in such a small village so i said well madam i can show you my identity card but i don't think you will find out who i am you will have my name uh, date of birth etc but I can tell you, after so many years trying to know who I am, I'm still trying. I don't know if that gives you an answer. Well, not really, <laughs> because the, I think the question is obviously, I'm not setting you down, but is a person that is very difficult to pin down. When I was introducing you to a friend the other day, I didn't know how to introduce you, because one of the things that I didn't say in my interest, you're also an author. You have now 11 books, so you decided at some point to have a new career writing, and very successfully so, from the most unusual books. I mean, the last one is called Valeria. Yeah, it's about a um, Roman town in Spain, practically unknown by the public. And, and before that, you, you books about, you know, Alexandria and your travels in, in Greece and travels in the middle and the Near East. Yes. Yeah. So, do you like everything? What is going on with well, you? Well, I'm interested in everything, really. The most important for me is a garden. But art, philosophy, uh, politics, even, not much. But, uh, you know, everything is connected. You see, knowledge in general is, is not divided in sectors. The more you know about everything, the more you will know about any special sector. So I'm interested in everything, really. But 
I consider myself, in answering the first question, a gardener, because I think which approaches me more to knowledge. Okay, so gardening as a way of knowing oneself and also knowing the world? Yes. Why do you find that in a garden? I tell you, I think human beings, since they exist, they are facing an enigma of nature, of the universe. And there are, in my opinion, three main ways to approach the enigma. First of all, religions from uh, all parts of the world. There are religions who try through myths, legends, to explain or try to explain what the enigma is. And by doing so, they create culture. The second way, my again, my opinion, is science. Everybody knows how science has uh, uh, brought us progress. But the thirst of metaphysics is still around us. We're still searching for something else which is not material. And the third one is arts. All the arts try to represent, in a way or another, this enigma. And out of all, all of them, there are, in my opinion, two which are the most or the best representation of the enigma. One is music. We don't know very well why, at a certain moment, just by listen, listening to uh, music, we are transported to a situation of, which is some like pre-language situation. The other manifestation is uh, garden. Why garden? Because in the, the garden represents the enigma as a part of nature. And once you're doing so, you are part of, of your own creation. It's very different from a, a, a book or a painting, while in something abstract, while in, in, um, in, uh, in the garden, is you're approaching life and death. It's your own, your own life. I mean, you, you, you are close to the enigma by, as an actor in a, in a certain way, which is all the time changing. I mean, garden is, is a unique uh, piece of art. While in painting, you finish a painting or a book, you have to restart again. The garden is one only piece of art. That is always evolving, that is always changing. It's changing all the, the time. Seasons. That's right. The season, the plants, yourself you are changing. And when you are in a garden, which most people don't look at garden as a collection of plants. The garden is a piece of art. Otherwise, it's no garden. Otherwise, you just go to a place where they grow plants. You know, yeah, to go to the nursery. Nursery <laughs> would be much easier. Yeah. But garden is you uh, show yourself, you create yourself a piece of art with plants, but also with water, with uh, stones, with uh, everything. So now that we are in a country that is famous for its gardens, right? Yes. The United Kingdom. And you know that gardening is one of the big hobbies uh, of the masses, I would say, yes, in the yes. United Kingdom. I know that. What do you think about British gardens? I have a mixed feelings. I can. I have to be honest. Huh? Of course, please. I love English gardens. Um, I think this passion of the English about gardens is has really the influence has been extraordinary all around the world. It has a negative part, which is you see when uh, Mediterranean countries with, uh, with totally different weather. I mean, uh, lack of uh, water, mainly, try to imitate uh, the English garden, all these uh, lawns and would need a lot of water, but it's, it's, it's a disaster. A garden, like any piece of art, is a representation of the culture. And our culture, in the case of Spain, is very much related to the Arab uh, tradition. And we have to to think about it. I mean, it's not the same, let's say, Kent or the north of Spain, which is a lot of rain, or compared with the south of Spain. So once you decide to create a garden, you have to consider your own culture. And it's not a collection, it's very important, it's not a collection of plants. 
I'll give you an example. There is, I admire very much a creator who is Scottish, Ian Hamilton Finley, who okay. died about what, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, was very much uh, confrontated, I don't know how you say that, I mean, fighting against well, this yeah, yeah. Uh, tradition of nursery type of garden in England. And he created a, a garden in Scotland, um, and I met him. That was Little Sparta. Little was Sparta, the name. Yeah. that's right. Little Sparta. And uh, it was a creation, a mixture of inspired in the old Greece and the French Revolution. Imagine the, uh, the mixture. Uh, but the result is fascinating. You can still go and see it. Well, it's nothing against the English gardens. They are marvelous English gardens and uh, creative type of things. But I'm a little bit reluctant to the collection, just simple collection of plants. So when you go to the Chelsea Flower Show, and I've been yes. there once with yes. you with my Panama hat and you yes. took all that. So what do you think about that show? Well, I think it's marvelous because you see the new uh, creative people, um, uh, landscape uh, people who know a lot about it. And it's changing a lot because in the old times, about what, 20 years ago or 50, 30 years ago, the Chelsea Flower Show was very different. It was still a collection, only a collection of plants, yeah. but now it's much more creative. Yeah, it's like painting as well. It's right? the same. Life, yes. living yes. painting. Yes, yeah. living painting. So you, you were mentioning Spain before. I mean, you are from Santander, right? In the yes. north of Spain, clearly a rainy city. But soon you left Spain. Yes. And you start traveling around the world. Yes. You live in places like Saudi Arabia. You live in places, like obviously, here in Britain. You work for the BBC at some point. You live in France. New York. New yes. York. You've been a, and now you're back. Where do you live now? In Madrid, right? Madrid. So. What happened? Santander was too small for you? It's very funny. I was so lucky that my parents decided when I was 15, that was at the time of Franco, and Spain was practically totally closed from the rest of the world. But I was very lucky that my mother decided to send me to Paris when I was 15. Oh. Imagine a young man, 15, boarding school. Boarding school being by himself in Paris for three months. That changed my life, totally. Of course, my wish, my desire was to do that at that moment. So when I came back from, uh, from Paris and went to the university a year later, I think, or two years later, to Madrid, I found Madrid it was a little village. And I felt prisoner. I wanted to know the world. I mean, Paris was nothing. And a few years later, uh, by chance, or not that by chance, I went to Yemen. Oh. And that was a shock for me. That I'm, I'm talking about Yemen 40 years ago. To Sana'a, I mean the whole country. We were still at that time, there was North Yemen, South Yemen. Mm -hmm. um, and since that moment, I said, well, I need to understand what the Arab culture is. Started to... Um, learn Arabic in, in Paris, and then, uh, very funny, or funnily enough, I went to live in New York, but my mind remained in Sana. Uh -huh. Sana is the capital. They say Seoul, that it was created before God existed. <laughs> You said that, the, the people in Yemen. Yes. So Sana was that. created before God existed. That's right. <laughs> so you were in New York, but your heart and your mind were in Sana. Why this fascination? Because I know that has continued. You're an Arabist. Yes. Whatever that means, you yeah. can explain that to us. But why this passion and fascination for the Orient? Well, you see, first, because still a it's kind of mystery, such a complex society. People try, in general, to put all these countries together. But, I mean, what is the relation between, let's say, Saudi Arabia, or the Arabs of the Arabic Peninsula, and Iran, for instance, all the Persian culture, the, 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 the origins, the culture, uh, gardens in, in, in Iran are wonderful. Or places like, um, I don't know, Lebanon, or places like that, they are totally different. So, 
I've been traveling in all of them, and I, some of them I lived for a while, in Egypt, or in Yemen, or in Saudi Arabia, or in uh, the Maghreb, in, in Morocco. Okay. And I learned a lot, I can tell you. So I have this, maybe, maybe it sounds a little potential, but I have this sort of two points of view, one from the eastern point of view, and another from the west. And that happened to me for the first time when I went to America. Mm -hmm. I always had this point of view, very European point of view. But when I went to America, I saw Europe from another point of view. That changes your mind. Yes. And once you are um, thinking, I know that you've been recently in Lebanon, you, you give conferences, you talk about garden and culture and art. Um, how do you see this part of the world? Mm -hmm. evolving because you know they, 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 we don't understand the Near East and the Middle East I love to say Near East sounds so wonderful <laughs> we don't understand this and you clearly you have made a career of not only understanding living that world but also spreading it to people I have seen a couple of your conferences on the gardens of Orient which is fascinating and the things that you tell through gardens yeah and now we understand why because you say gardens are a part of explaining the enigma yes of the world so going back to the question how do you see this part of the world evolving well forecast the future here there or anywhere is or practically impossible there are so many uh, data which is changing all the time you know, what is happening in the Middle East is uh, what is happening in the West and what is happening in America, because now we are living in a world which is all connected. So, talking only about the Middle East, there are mainly three powers at the moment. You have uh, Saudi Arabia, of course, Iran, Egypt in a way, but Israel. Israel. So, Israel, Saudi Arabia and Iran. So how this relation between these three powers is changing all the time, it depends on the petrol, the situation, the Ukraine war, the situation in England and the whole Europe, and particularly so about America. So I, I can't really forecast what is going to happen. Just imagine for a second that there is a problem of water in the Nile in Egypt and this country probably become a chaos and that will affect all the Middle East or a war between Israel and Iran that will uh, stabilize, stabilize, yeah. stabilize not only the Middle East but also Europe yeah. and the world. Well, I hope not, I mean obviously. I hope, I hope and, 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 But in any case you still go there, you've been recently in Lebanon, in, yes. ba in Baalbek. Well I, I was uh, very fortunate. The, the Spanish Institute of Cervantes invited me to lectures, one in Baalbek, which I was fascinated, because it's a lovely old-fashioned hotel called Palmira Hotel, just by the ruins, the Roman ruins. And it was very shocked in a way, because there were many, many people. None of them spoke Spanish. Yeah. So I have to to, to, to make a, a, a lecture in sort of half Spanish, half Arabic, and with the help of a lady, which yeah. always was also translating. And when I asked them, who are these people? I said, well, this is the mayor of the city, the chief of the police, etc. He said, but this area is the area which is very Muslim. Yeah. So <laughs> very, they were fascinated because the subject was Arab God, so they were really very interested. Do you prefer Orient or Arab gardens to gardens like here or in Spain or? Not really, I love all gardens because really gardens are an expression. As an expression, anybody can express himself through the gardens. So you don't need to be very rich, you have just a piece of land but once you decide to make a garden, uh, you have to decide what are you going to express with it. For me, this is very important. And talking about the garden and expressing yourself, in 2010, yes. if I recall, because I was there when you were still thinking about it, you created what is called the Jardín Alquímico de la Trinidad, 
which I will translate yes. into the alchemical yes. garden of Trinity, yes. in the Spanish village yes. of Ucles in yes. Cuenca, is an alchemist garden based in the alchemist philosophy, translating different alchemy phases. I mean, it's so complicated, so exotic. It is. It I is. tried to find it online, and the only alchemical garden I could find was yours and a little one in France. That was it. That's it. That's it. Well, I'll tell you, I'm always fascinated by alchemy. It's so esoteric in many ways, which is connects very much with my mind, which is a little bit chaotic, you see. But how to translate alchemy into a garden? Well, it's complicated. First of all, because the subject is comp very, very complex. And by chance, I went with the association, I was the president at that time, Association of Friends of Gardens in Spain, went to the south of France, to Provence, and I saw, I was very surprised, there was a Jardin de l'Alchimiste, the garden of the alchemist. So I called them, there was a private garden, and they said, well, I'm sorry, I said, you can't visit it. I said, why? I said, we came from Spain just to, with the purpose of visiting this garden. And he said, you see, um, there was wild boars who destroyed the whole garden. So I said, how sorry I was, but then I said, well, I'm going to be the only one making an alchemy garden. So I decided to do it in that little village, which is very, very old, 12th uh, century uh, village with an enormous monastery. And um, my garden is under the monastery. And the trouble was how do I going to create a garden based on alchemy? So alchemy is a very complicated subject. I'm not going to go into that, but just to presume. The old alchemists tried to get gold uh, by transforming basically uh, iron. Because they believe iron under the earth, after many years, maybe centuries, will be by itself, by the influence of the planets, will become gold. But they thought maybe in our lab, we can buy adding certain products like mercury or whatever, maybe we can shorten the period. So there were some alchemists who were very intelligent, but only interested in the material part, which is getting gold, and working usually for emperors or kings, etc. We were uh, shorten of, of, of money. But they, um, I am very interested those who really didn't want to find the gold, but basically either immortality, like the Chinese emperors, or wisdom. Because in the process, which is a very long process, uh, they used to have failures and successes. But you need to be very patient because it's not, you are not having success in a direct way. You will progress, and then you will go backwards, and then up, and then down, etc., etc. So, translated that into the garden, in that process, there are the different colors. The first face was the, what they call it the black face, uh, the nigredo, they call it. Everything, the plants are black, and I have a parterre planted with iron. So, you will see how the iron, or you could imagine how the iron is going to be transformed into gold. The second phase is white, uh, or it's all planted with white roses, and you see already some white materials um, which imitate the silver. The third phase is green, it's with the alchemist, used to call citrinitas. Citrinitas in, it's, is referred to the greenish and yellowish color because they thought maybe we already finished, we have been very successful, but it was not. They were against, they have to go backwards and restart again. And finally, the great success is the red. The red one, which when they succeeded in getting the gold. Why red, if it was gold? Well, red and gold is very much connected in that um, 
how could I say, philosophical idea. It was they call it Ruggedo. Okay. And in, the, in my garden, in the middle of all these red flowers, it's full of red flowers, red roses, there is enormous stone, which is the philosophical stone. The philosopher stone, yes. yes. <laughs> so, which is very, let's say, I can't uh, find the word, but it's a kind of, the idea they had is when uh, God created the world, they believed that maybe in this sort of Big Bang, there was kind of material that maybe remained in our planet. So if they could find that material, added that in the, in the process, immediately they would be successful. Of course it was just it. So the primordial material. Primordial that material, okay. that's, I get it. that's right. So then, so you have all of this very unusual. Yes. Uh, so these alchemical garden of Trinity is open to the public or closed? Well, it's, it's not, but anybody who really is interested just by uh, going to my web, um, I'd be delighted uh, to receive, but I don't want, uh, um, you know, lots of buses and tourists just, because they are not interested really, they just want to have fun, but I'm, I'm only interested in those who are interested in gardens are most welcome. Well, now we know, and you can contact here. The internationalist and we'll let you know, but only for five. Yes. So this fascination with the garden, at the same time of you creating this garden, you sort of, well, a little bit earlier than that, you started writing. Yes. Okay. Uh, and, and you have now published 11 books, is that correct? Yes, more or less. Yes, yeah. 11. Yes. You don't even know, more or less. Oh, <laughs> yes, yes, 11, because I'm in the process of publishing, oh, but 11. And your books have the most incredible titles, weird, uh, strange, really, really. I mean, some of them, no, I mean, I, I mean, I cannot even translate some of them because I wouldn't know how to find the words, the hermitage or something with Aristoteles, with the... Uh, uh, with headphones. Well, one and of those, which is the, the, <laughs> the history of, of uh, hermits in the garden, yeah. which is a very good tradition in England. I mean, okay. particularly so in the 17th, 18th century, uh, they used to, they started in Spain in the 17th century, but developed in England. It was a fashion to have hermits by, pay by salary in the garden. So it's, it's a subject which is so fascinating. So what, a decoration? A kind of ornamental hermits. So you, they will uh, develop a ruin or a, a, a chapel, will uh, ask the hermit to dress in a certain way. So when they have a party, the guests will uh, look at the ruin. I mean, it's very romantic idea and very well, frivolous in a way. Very you see, there was the time when uh, a nobility in England decided in the end of the 17th century, 18th century, to leave London and live in the country. And they have these enormous properties with gardens and ha ha and all these things. And that idea of the owner, instead of doing himself becoming a hermit, he preferred to pay someone to be a hermit, to be a hermit, oh my to reflect God. his own mind. Which is very frivolous at the same time, it's fascinating. And why did you write about that? Well, because I thought it was a very, well, it's been very successful, that book. Yeah. yeah. But is, is it something that, I mean, there are other books about it? Or? Well, they, there are English books about it. Okay. I told you something, an anecdote. Many years ago, I was in, a, <coughs> I was in Camden Town, and one of these antique uh, markets. Yeah. And there was an old uh, antique. Uh, bookshop, I found the most weird a book. It was a fashion of ornamental hermits in the 18th century. Fashion. I mean, <laughs> the costumes of the hermits, how they should dress. Believe it or not, I never found it again. That book, I didn't buy it, but the, the, the antique dealer asked me for an enormous amount of money. I said, how is it possible? It's a very tiny book. He looked at me, he said, what about the title? <laughs> yeah, what, what about the title? <laughs> what about the subject? Oh, I so see. I couldn't say anything. 
Okay, so I'll have to find that book. Maybe. But I, I can add something. I'm very lucky that have an uh, editor who really is delighted, apparently, and he says, Manuel, write whatever you want, because we are the, 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 the editor is the Cuadernos de Laberinto, okay. which is, uh, uh, yes. Well, I have read most of your books, I have to say. They are fascinating because they tell a story, your story, and your, in your view of the world, which is a very unusual view, because you're not bringing, because you're living in all these countries, because all the pursuits that you have had throughout your life, you know, from, as I said, from being now a gardener author to having been an antique dealer or, or an economist, because mm -hmm. you train as an economist. So clearly it's a very fascinating view of the world. And because of that, I wanted to ask you, Yes, I always ask my guests, you know, you're an internationalist, and clearly you are a real internationalist guy. You put me to shame. Um, so we must touch on travel a little. And let me ask you this question that in your case must be very difficult, may not. Keith, what's your all-time favorite place to visit? I'll tell you what, which one is, my God. Finally, I've been traveling all around the world in the most unusual places. There are three countries which I really still enjoy. Practically, I go every year. One is Greece, the other one is Egypt, and the third one is Iran. These three countries, because of their culture and their relation with philosophy and gardens, are for me very important. But where the place I feel really, I could say, happy, or at least in harmony, is my God. And being happy is the same as being in harmony? Uh, kind of, yes. yes. At my age, I think the important thing is to be in harmony with yourself. To know yourself, which is, if we come back to this first question, mm -hmm. I'm still searching, but uh, at least I feel in harmony. I don't feel uh, with pressure. As soon as I arrive in my garden, I feel so well. Let's so hear... I have the feeling it's like having a child, that I'm being missed by my plants. It sounds silly, but this is the feeling I have. And everything smiling, happy around me, the water, the fish, the, everything. And now we have that boy who left Spain for Paris at the age of 15 and then traveled the world and lived in places from Yemen to Saudi Arabia to, to New York. and. It's a global citizen of sorts, and now he's thinking that his world is a little village in Cuenca, in the middle of Spain, and within that village, his little, beautiful, I have to say, but his little garden. So you have gone 360, right? You have gone back to the beginning, mm -hmm. and back to being a small place. Mm -hmm. Is it because the world, once you have visited the world, you realize that, I don't know, the truth is inside us, maybe, or, or, or why? What, what happened? Is too much noise out there? Um, difficult to answer. I'm still very interested in traveling. I love traveling and discover certain cultures and all the same cultures I know because for me, Greece is uh, all places like Alexandria or certain places, even more places in Iran or in Egypt. They are so wonderful. But after staying there, or visiting there for a while, I need to come back to my, to my place, to my garden, because it is where you know, I create things. I, I need to, to feed myself with other cultures, but then with that feeding, I create because garden is you are creating all the time. As soon as I arrive, I will change this part. I will do something new. It's all the time changing. So we are saying, if I understand, and I have heard you say this before, or some sort of that, which is, you need to be within yourself, to be quiet. That's right. Because the world is too noisy. I mean, That's right. It's a chaos. Telephones and computers. Chaos. Chaos. Yeah. Uh, you see, I have the feeling, but it is um, not uh, specialist. I think technology <coughs> is a wonderful thing if you use it properly, but at the same time, I think it's creating such an amount of people very lonely, very sad, and 
and uh, it, it, they can't go away from technology. I mean, the, the telephone, the computer, everything, from the moment they get up in the morning until they go to bed. So I try to get as much as I can away from that. And uh, everything I learned, I did it from the garden, from nature, by observation. And from that, you need calm. Calm, not do it if you are all the time with machines. But you need time to, to, to think about yourself, about life, and observation is the best thing. So you think that today, actually, the world is the opposite, is giving us a stimuli, continuous right. stimuli. Yes. From, you know, you said the computers, like your laptop, your telephone, Instagram, saying all yes. this social media. So we never have a minute for ourselves. That's we true. never think. I'm very sorry for young people. Really, it's terribly sorry. I mean, how can they create really properly, deeply, if they don't have, I don't know, half an hour of calm, one day of calm, and the si silence is very important. Without silence and loneliness for a while, you cannot create, that's my opinion. I mean, in the middle of noise, in the middle of all these machines, I mean, you create, but you create very superficially. I mean, it's something difficult to explain, but I, I feel sorry for young people, really. They are not getting enough money, their life is very hard, and um, I have the feeling that they are, you know, in spite of the number of followers and likes they get in their, I think they are very lonely and very, very poor. It's a very different world we live today. Yes. But again, we all use technology. I see you use yes. your phone, and yes, I do. Uh, you do. It's important. Right? Yes. So you're not against that. You're no, against of that. course not. When I write books or making research um, with my computer and all the time with my uh, my telephone, because sometimes how what year Nietzsche was born? It's immediate. It's fantastic. Yeah. In the old time, you have to go to a library and took a long time. And now it's, it's very fast, but at the same time it's very superficial because when it's hard to find your research and you pursue the research, this is a very good method because at yeah. the same time you are, you are thinking about it. This is fascinating. I could go on talking about, about this. So let me ask you this question. That, what does the future hold for you? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think my, the future is my present. I, I can't imagine a future different uh, as, 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 as my own life at uh, the present time. Uh, my, my future is, I'm uh, wishing, in a way, I'm delighted in London, this uh, moment. But uh, at the same time, I'm, I'm looking forward to go back to my garden. Not to Spain particularly, but to my garden, yes. And this is my present. And I have new ideas as soon as I arrive. I will change certain things. I will create new things. I will uh, take some plants from one place to another because probably they will be happier. So I think. So I don't know if that answers you. That no, answers my question. Let me, that that makes me think. Um, in all our conversation, clearly, uh, politics have not played any uh, any moment. It seems to me that you live in a world that, in a way, it's outside of the political discourse and all the noise that we're getting these days, not only in this country, mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. Is that part of your life? Have you gone to a point that that is separate to... to well, I your... try not to be very much involved in that because my feeling is our politics are becoming like a show. It's a constant show that people like to, you know, to just, it's like going to the theater. <laughs> and uh, if you have like your that. own hero, either a man or a woman, the hero, and the hero has to win. Yeah. Otherwise, they will be condemned. So I, I'm fed up for that show. I'm interested in politics, but when I hear a politician or something which... Uh, are doing it really interested in, in in the life of human beings, you know, to rather than in the show. Yes. And the ratings. Yes, that's right. <laughs> I mean the, the show is 
is repeating itself all the time. I mean, I don't want to put England as an example, but in the last uh, months has been uh, all around the world. People didn't understand what is happening in this country. Yeah. Not even the English, I suppose. Uh, this is, I assume. But no, the, the British are, are quite confused about, about what's happening in this country. Yes, well, fortunately, I hope now, from now on, uh, they will be more flexible and more understandable and more more harmony because which i hate is when uh, whatever the practice politician uh, philosophy is separate people instead of united people and at this moment i have the feeling england in the case of the united kingdom is separated in two parts which is very bad yeah. i mean uh, separation of uh, you know citizens but, but that's happening all over the world right all over the try, world. Try yes, yes, um, yes yes everywhere what well, is happening in Spain too? Huh? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm putting the example of England because now it's the fashion. England is of, <laughs> the fashion. I mean, United Kingdom is of fashion. I mean, it's all the first um, in all the papers. You know, yeah. in front, front of the news on the front page. So, do you think, just to close, that despite our difference, we are all the same around the world? Yes, I do. Yes, I mean, not only that. There is a Italian philosopher. A book called Metamorphosis, which uh, it said we are part, it's like a mosaic. I don't know if you say in English mosaic, mosaic. yes, yeah. a mosaic. And we are part of the whole thing. I mean, we, we, whatever you do, is influence everything around and stone, and a, a, a plant, and uh, animals, everything. We are all together. So, the important thing is that. Uh, it should be in, in a kind of harmony in the whole world yeah. because we are part of the same thing. Well, Manuel, with those words, I want to thank you. It has been fascinating, a little bit delving into your story, into your life, into your very, I would say, uh, eclectic life. Eclect. Yes, eclectic life. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Manuel. Thank you very much, Julio. You've been listening to The Internationalist with me, Julio Bruno. Thank you so much to my guest, Manuel Gomez Anuarbe, for a great conversation. Tweet us at the Int Podcast with any suggestions or feedback. And if you enjoy the podcast, please leave a rating and review on iTunes, Spotify, or your chosen podcast app. You can sign up to receive an email whenever a new episode drops at our website, theinternationalist.fm. Thank you to my producers, Alison and the crew at Podcast Farmers. Thank you.